So Debbie said that the Ohio weather has been uh, exceptionally warm because I'm new and I'm not quite <laughs> ready for the harsh winter that I'm sure I will um, get. So thank you so much. Um, as President Grindle said, I'm here to be President CEO of Future Ready Columbus, and I'll tell you about that at the end. Um, hopefully the conversation is going to go like this, and I say hopefully because I want a lot of audience participation. When I found out who was sitting in the audience, uh, the goal is to share with you my leadership style and experiences, but to also hear from you, specifically as it relates to Ohio, since I'm onboarding, because all cultures are local, all politics local, and I just want to make sure that I hear from you as I uh, take on this great venture. So we're going to, uh, that's the food for thought. So as we're um, listening and interacting during the presentation, please think of systems um, thinking and leadership so that when we become interactive, you can talk to me about your experiences, give me some um, advice and counsel. Um, I will share my work on systems thinking and systems change through personal experiences, um, particularly at the state level running two state agencies um, that were engaged in some pretty aggressive change. Then um, we're going to talk about interdependence among stakeholders and how in systems thinking uh, we can think we have hit the mark and we go off running to implement the plan and find out that we're leaving a lot of people behind because of perspective. And then, of course, as I shared earlier, I would like your thoughts, experiences with systems change. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the new venture that is Future Ready Columbus. So perspective, the title for the topic today is Perspective, Influencing, Facilitating Systems Change. And so I want to put in context um, what I mean by those terms. Now, perspective, we all know, is point of view, um, how people look at situations and facts to determine how uh, they are related in some way. But perspective also, from an arts point of view, is looking at a kind of two-dimensional um, picture and adding depth and width and height so that people can get a better picture idea of what something would look like. And the reason I wanted to call that particular definition out is because of what I've learned through leadership and facilitating change is that what I see, and I think everybody's seeing the same thing that I'm seeing, when we start getting into the throes of doing the work, finding out that people really saw something completely different. So perspective is point of view, but it's also what do you see as the issues before us versus what the other person with whom you've had a cogent conversation sees as the issue before us. And so when I'm talking about systems change, I'm really um, relating research from Peter Stroh, who um, graduated from I think I can say this in the room, undergrad, University of Michigan, um, and then uh, got his graduate uh, degree, doctorate at MIT, and he is a research and author in uh, systems thinking and organizational change. And one of the things that he says about a system cha systemic change is that it really does pervade all parts of an organization or a system, and then take into account how those parts are interrelated and interdependent. And with leadership, sometimes we are so um, adamant about our sense of urgency about getting something done, we kind of check off the box that we've had conversations with people, but we don't probably sometimes go deeply enough to make sure that all those interrelated parts and how those parts are interdependent on each other can be impacted by short-sighted goals that could have long-term consequences. And so facilitate, the reason I said facilitate instead of lead in the topic is because good leaders do one or three things and have to know when to do it. And it's trite, but it's true. We have to know when to lead, we have to know when to follow, and we need to know when to get out of the way. And so when we're doing, um, engage in systems thinking and systems change, the voice of the people who make up those interrelated, interdependent parts have to be taken into accountability. 
And as I share my personal experiences with you, um, I will better articulate how one thinks that's happening and only when we get ready to implement with Fidelity find out everybody's not with us. And then this is where I tell the tale of two cities. Um, and I've kind of got Dixonian on you. Um, <laughs> Delaware was the first state where I was the Secretary of Education. In Delaware, I was appointed by a governor. And the reason I got to that particular spot in a pretty short time, after being in the state for two and a half years, I went to the state be, to be a district superintendent. I was going in after this rock star. I mean, he was being written up in Ed Week and all of the reform journals. He was an amazing leader, and he really was. He's, he's really bright. We both had gone through something called the Broad Academy for Urban Superintendents, which is um, funded by Elon Edith Broad Foundation. And Mr. Broad came to the United States as an immigrant, and his family, he's, I think Mr. Broad now is about 85 or 86, and they settled in Detroit, Michigan. And that's when city urban schools were the centers. They were the mecca. That's where good things were really happening before people started moving into suburbs. So he has always believed that I think the business school, I know the business school at Michigan State is um, the Eli Broad uh, Business School. And so he has always been a belief of the belief that because it happened for me, it could happen for anyone. So he invests in leaders who particularly want to go in and work in urban centers and take on the challenges that persist there. So the superintendent before me had finished, so when I went to uh, this job, I knew him, I talked to him, I respected him, and he went on to a bigger and better opportunity. <laughs> but one thing stuck out in my mind through the interview process. In the last two years, there had been 28 audits. Now, nothing was ever found, but there were 28 audits. So I stepped back and said to the board, I want, and they were individual audits. It may have been for special ed compliance or for Title I compliance. So I stepped back and said to the board, I want a comprehensive audit. I want everything done simultaneously. That was March when I went there. I got the results back in May, and the state auditor told me that in the next month we were not going to be able to pay anyone. We had absolutely no money. We were in a $20 million deficit. So here I am, I've been in the state March, April, May, three months, and I have to go to the governor and say, I know you don't know me, but I need to borrow $20 million. <laughs> Because if you don't give me $20 million, people in this district who have children in college, who have mortgages to pay, who stepped out on faith that the people who were running the district actually were doing a good job and being fiscally responsible. So she thought about it and wasn't um, affirmative right away. So I started working my delegation from the county in which I lived, and we need $20 million. This isn't for me. I just showed up. This is for the people <laughs> who have been here working really hard, doing amazing things. Um, and obviously someone knew something was going on because there were 28 audits. Someone was looking for something. And what had happened is they spent $1 10 times. Um, they took every contract they signed on for, they paid for it out of their Title I dollars. So, I could show the vendor that, see, we have this much money in Title I, but I didn't let him know that I was showing it to nine other vendors, too. So the governor called me in and was very firm, but gave the $20 million so that we could move on. But it forced us to look at the system in a way that probably would have never happened. Because here I am following this amazing leader with all these brilliant ideas, and so now I feel like the Grinch, because now I have to shut down programs, um, now I have to cut um, awards as far as innovation um, and creativity, and kind of be stuck with just the basics. We've got to get, we've got to educate these kids, make sure that they're literate and proficient, 
when they go to the next grade. And we're just going to have to do it with good, solid teaching and building relationships with parents. And I had to lay off a lot of people because with programs come a lot of people to run programs. Because I had to do that, I had to meet with the union. I think it's 30 inches wide and 96 miles long. We, you get from one tip of Delaware to the other in about two and a half hours. So when I first got there, I was in Newcastle County, the northern part of Philadelphia, and someone said to me, when you whisper something in Newcastle County, two seconds later they repeat it in Sussex. That's the beach. So this is a relationship, relationship, relationship environment. So I call the state union in because even though in that tiny place it's divided in three counties, there are 19 districts. So kind of like um, Franklin County, um, within the county there are many districts. Each had its own a negotiated contract with this union. So I had to work with the state union leadership, especially around teachers, because as I was having to reduce the workforce, Instead of just going by tenure, if I needed an occupational therapist or a speech therapist, and we wanted to, the children to have some kind of holistic environment in which to learn. So arts, I was protecting. So we needed a music teacher. The librarian, I was protecting. We needed a librarian. So I had to sit with the state union leadership with their locals and negotiate that. Um, we tried, we worked very hard. The surrounding districts were amazing. They worked with me to try to place these people because most of them were amazing teachers. <coughs> so that's when I got into systems thinking um, and systems change. I fell into it out of necessity. And it was amazing the way people came together. But we had something around which uh, to come. And we focused on the children. Imagine that, that we really did focus on what was in the best interest of these children and what was in the best interest of the district. Christina School District was the largest district at that time in the state. So I was asked to come to um, the state once the new governor was um, elected to be the Secretary of Education. And that's because out of necessity, I had had to build relationships with everyone. I had to go every month and meet with the General Assembly and report to them how we were tracking on paying them back their $20 million and what we were doing to keep families um, assuaged as, as we were kind of navigating this. And when I got to the state, we had this amazing business partner um, while I was a district superintendent and had been there for a while called the Rodell Foundation. And it evolved from the Maryland Business Roundtable, uh, the Maryland Chamber of Commerce, and uh, a lot of other civic communities, the, the, the foundation, um, and some think tanks very much like the Ross uh, Leadership Institute. And they had, of course, philanthropic dollars to help us out. That, that really did um, allow us to give children uh, great opportunities. But they also wanted to um, develop a network of schools across the state. And what I really liked about this network of schools was that it wasn't a network just focused on those schools where challenged students attended. That certainly was a part of it. But they also wanted to highlight um, schools in advantaged neighborhoods that were doing amazing creative work. Because at the end of the day, we were looking for best practices. And because we were so small and worked together so well anyway, um, the system of working from district to district was easily aligned. The good news for being Secretary of Education in Delaware is I had been one of the superintendents. So they were my friends. And they would actually take my calls and listen to me. I, look, I used to be one of them who said, what are they doing at the Department of Education? Do they talk to each other? <laughs> so having sat in that seat and going to the department right away, I knew what systems I needed to fix. For example, every Friday, I sent out a Friday memo to all the superintendents to highlight anything that they needed. If it were something from state government, the federal government, it was, if it were something that we needed for them to know. Because before then, five people from the department on the same day could send the same memo asking sort of kind of for the same information but for a different reason. 
And that was just churning staff time. So we streamlined that work, hearing from the superintendents, let me know if you get feedback that um, we are not giving you all the information that you need, or if the creep starts again and you start getting three or four emails from the department in a single day, let me know. So that went wonderfully well. And then how many of you have heard of Race to the Top? OK. Race to the Top was a federal grant um, from the um, Department of Education under Secretary Duncan's leadership that would award dollars to districts who were doing creative and innovative work at the state. Um, because we were working so well with the Rodell, Rodell Foundation to determine this statewide network of schools and because we had done a lot of work to align systems across the state, um, for example, Delaware was one of the first states to have a longitudinal data system because they were part of Brown versus Board of Education. So when Governor Pete DuPont was governor in the 1980s, he started tracking kids from kindergarten through high school as early as that so that we could track where they were going to school. We applied for Race to the Top and we got it. And for those of you who don't understand or know about that, that was a four point um, three five billion dollar grant awarded to states. Um, Delaware and Tennessee were the first two states to receive the awards and it was because Tennessee also had something very similar to the Rodell Foundation called Tennessee SCORE. So they had the business community, they had civic leaders, they had government leaders all working toward the same goal, aligning systems and making sure that we were sharing best practices. With that work, um, I was right next door to Maryland and the superintendent, here's the second city. So everything is lovely in Delaware. People work together. The expectation is too small. You went to church with people. You golf with people. You saw everyone in the grocery store. It was nice. And so Maryland called and said, you guys have done such amazing work. Would you consider coming to Maryland as state superintendent of schools? And I said, no, because the superintendent signed up for this work that we're doing because I was one of them and I told them I would stay through at least the first year of implementation. The first year is planning. Everyone's on planning. So I didn't go. I stayed in Delaware and the next year they hired an interim. They came back and said, okay, now that you've gotten through your first year of implementation, will you come to Maryland? Because they got the Race to the Top award the year after us. So I get to Maryland and it was different. Um, not as big as Ohio, but bigger than Delaware and local control was the word of the land. Where in Delaware it was centralized because it's a small state, the department had a lot of sway over whatever happened. Get to Maryland, if you didn't say may I, it probably didn't happen at the local level. So now they've gotten this grant, $250 million from the federal government to do this work, signed off on it. And the difference too of the two cities or the states is when we got the grant in Delaware, everyone signed off, every local board member, every superintendent, every union president. Got to Maryland, about five of the 24 districts, union's president signed off. So I'm thinking, now they put us through all those hoops in Delaware. How did Maryland get this grant? <laughs> so we had to start talking about systems. And so having a conversation with the governor, the governor, through executive order, had to compel people to work together. So he formed a committee, a council, that was co-chaired by the state superintendent of schools and the state union president, and said, we have taken this money. We've got to come up with some kind of systems alignment. We've got to think together on how we're going to do this, modify, collaborate, come to consensus, but the goal is the goal. And that's the way we started working there. It was very siloed. Um, Maryland, like most counties and states, had, has very wealthy districts and very poor districts. And they did not talk to each other. As a matter of fact, Montgomery County is the biggest county, wealthiest county in Maryland, and it is called the state of Montgomery. And they don't listen to anyone. So getting them to think systemically and to align themselves for children who, by the way, transience is everywhere. They could live in Montgomery County today and be in Anne Arundel County tomorrow 
being west of Maryland, living in the mountains. It didn't matter, so how do we align this work? We got there. Um, but the problem is with both Delaware and with Maryland, we agreed on the what, and the what was in the center, and um, that is students and families, that we were going to improve teaching and learning so that our children would grow and graduate from high school ready for college and career. Ready for college and career. So we had to start having this conversation also about everybody going to a four-year college or university. And if that's what everybody wanted, that's wonderful. But we have some students who, by the way, are really, really bright students who may want to work with their hands. They may want to go into electronics. They may want to go into welding. They may want to go into their father's, their mother's plumbing business. They don't want to go to college and university. And so what are we doing in career and technical education to make sure that we're building relationships with these students so that they know what they want to do and we have that offer for them? So again, as a state, we started looking at career and technical education. And the General Assembly um, assembled uh, something called the Augustine Commission. Norm, Norman Augustine was the longtime CEO of Lockheed Martin and lived in Montgomery County, Maryland, and had uh, been the chair of the Maryland Business Roundtable, which is only focused on education, STEM only. So they asked um, Mr. Augustine, Dr. Augustine, to chair this committee about economic development in Maryland and what he found out along the way is especially mid and small sized businesses were not able to find employees because our kids were coming out without the skills. And if they did hire them, they had to spend a lot of money to just train and prepare them. So we passed um, legislation in the state that said uh, we were pilot in two districts, this happening this year, a CTE program partnering with the business in the community so that the students could have apprenticeships for which they will be paid. And, and hopefully what's going to happen as this continues to evolve is they will be taking dually enrolled courses um, focused primarily for those students who want to go into career and technical education on community colleges. So they're graduating from high school with a diploma and an associate's degree. And by the way, an apprenticeship so they network and most of them are going to walk out going to something and the goal was they need to walk out going to something when they walk across that stage graduating are they going to college university or are they going to work but having 18 year olds walk out with absolutely no idea what's going on is not a good place to be so we all agreed on the what and we had all these um, interrelated, interdependent parts. And we were planning in both states, and it was going really well. But then came why. And I'll tell you the biggest sticking point was as we were doing the work, people could get their arms around the standards and assessments, more rigorous standards and assessments. They could get their arms around looking at the lowest 5% performing school and do something there. They could look at efficiencies also. That was kind of hard when you're negotiating contracts. But we worked on what could we outsource, what kinds of efficiencies could we have both at the state level and at the local level to outsource some things where people weren't paying for full FTEs and the benefits and all that that went with it. The sticking point was the accountability. And the accountability hit a roadblock in two places. One, Maryland has had a national reputation for being a high performing state. And so whenever one transforms its standards to new standards and assessments, you zero out. You start all over again, you have to get baseline data. So parents are used to their children being in the 85% proficient range or the 95% proficient range. And now with these more rigorous standards and assessments, they may be in the 40% range. And the same thing happened in Delaware. Delaware, because it's small, did a better job. Uh, I traveled with the governor across the state saying, we're implementing these new standards and assessments. There's going to be a sea change. Doesn't mean that your child is learning less 
it means that we are asking more, more rigorous standards and assessment. The second roadblock was now teachers' evaluations were going to be tied to student performance. And the mistake we made in the Race to the Top Award in the work was that we rolled out rigorous standards and assessment. At the same time, we said we we're going to roll out new teacher evaluations tied to those assessments. The idea of accountability, because students are supposed to grow, and it was a growth model, uh, where did they start at the beginning of the year, and where did they end up? But the teachers were right. It was hard for me to take them. You know, I pushed back initially. We have to do this. We have to find a way. But we, when we have a new assessment that's untested, um, when we're still trying to kind of balance out the, the validity and reliability of the test, um, when we are building a baseline so that we can know what growth will look like with this new assessment, it really was kind of unfair to hold teachers' evaluations hostage to how the kids are performing. When, by the way, <clears throat> they're also unpacking and learning and becoming comfortable with new standards. So what we then ended up with was stalemates in both places. Even though Delaware's story started out really well and Maryland got there, we focused on the what, that kind of North Star on, on which everyone could agree improve student achievement, readiness for college and career, better teaching and learning. What we forgot was why. That's the conversation we didn't have. Why should we change? Okay, Delaware's rolling right along doing okay. Maryland ha has, has this national reputation. Why are we doing this? Why are we upsetting the apple cart? Why are we changing our entire system? So when we get back to perspective, even though all of those people were sitting at the table, a part of every conversation, their point of view about what was happening and the way they saw it was completely different from the point of view and the way it was going to play out according to the people, state leaders, national leaders, the United States Department of Education who gave us these awards, would see it. So what we learned is that we had to step back and we traveled the entire state um, in Maryland, too. And some of them, you may have seen on national news, a parent was <laughs> arrested. It got ugly. It was not nice in a lot of those places because they were, these standards are horrible. Why are you bringing them here? My, look, I bought this house to live in this community so my child could go to this school, and you're completely destroying it. What system is this? What kind of systems thinking is this? Leave us alone. We want local control. So we stepped back and talked about why should we change. Here are the data. Even our students in our high-performing schools who are taking all the advanced level courses, when compared to high-performing states and when compared to some of the international data, they're not doing OK. It's mediocrity. So are we saying we're OK with mediocrity? Are we saying that? These children are doing well because they come from families who, when they come into the world, know that you're going to college. And, and that is the mindset from day one. So everything that we looked at dictated <coughs> and illustrated, excuse me, that so goes the socioeconomic level, so goes student performance. But there were best practices in other places where people were overcoming that and students were doing well. So that's why we should change. Why should we work together? <clears throat> because um, we together are much smarter than we are alone. And there is creativity all across the state in every single district. So instead of reinventing the wheel, and I have allergies, and I heard that Ohio is great for allergies. <laughs> Thank you. So instead of reinventing the wheel, why don't we just, this collective impact, let's share what we're doing and get this done together. Then once we talk about why we should change, why should we work together, and what we should do, um, and Secretary Duncan and I are, are relatively good friends. Um, I 
implemented his grant in two states. But I had to go to the secretary and say, this evaluation thing, I'm going to have to disappoint you on that one. We've got to focus on making sure these teachers really understand these standards and have time to get grounded, have time to build up. Because when the teachers were saying we need more time, I thought they were stalling because they were trying to kick the can down the road. <clears throat> and we surveyed them after we went out to all the districts. We went into some of the classrooms to see implementation. And what they were saying is, I need time to understand this. I, I don't have textbooks that are aligned to these standards. I don't have materials. I don't have resources for parents to use with their kids at home. You've got to give us time to build a repository of materials and supplies so that we can do a great job. And so I went to the secretary and said, we're going to need more time. Well, if you do that, you're going to be sanctioned. Well, with all due respect, and I do respect, and not only respect, I really like the secretary a lot. You do what you've got to do, and I'll do what I have to do. And we'll figure it out. And then state by state by state that was involved in the same work came with the same uh, concern. We want to implement the standards and the assessments well, but we've got to take the pressure off these kids because um, in, in both the states, there were high school graduation requirements that students had to score certain scores in English language arts, math, science, and social studies, or they didn't get their high school diploma. <clears throat> so not only were the teachers concerned about their evaluations, parents were now concerned about their children's graduation. So that's when the systems thinking came together and we bonded. We bonded around, okay, we're not going to slow the train down, we're going to get here, but we've got to have some relief in other places. And of course the secretary um, started granting the relief that we needed. And then at the end of the day, the governors and the General Assembly is like, why did we do this? Why, why are we fighting this fight? Why did we bother? And we all came to the conclusion because it was for the common good. And we all came uh, to that kind of piercing refrain of 1983, a nation at risk, the rising tide of mediocrity. Are we saying it's OK to be just good enough? Or are we going to stretch ourselves and our children so they can be competitive in a global environment? Because students no longer just compete with this, the children in Ohio, don't just compete with those in West Virginia or Kentucky or Indiana. Uh, we are living in a global economy. So that interdependence, that those interrelationships matter. Um, and states not only need to come together and work with each other, but within states, we really do need to think systemically about what we want for our children for their future. And if we don't figure that out, trust becomes an issue. Because remember that perspective? When we thought one thing and somebody else's point of view was different, and we said we're going to take that all and build consensus, and then when we started unfolding the work, people start backing back and thinking, now that's not what you said you were going to do, and that's not what I understood it to be. So we had to then reboot and go back and build trust. So this is what I would like for you to engage me now. And after you talk to me a little bit, I'm going to talk to you about Future Ready. I am coming into a new state once again. Um, people have to get to know me. I have to get to know people, build confidence and trust um, in my goals, my ambitions, um, my passion. But I also have to understand the goals, the ambitions, the perspective of the people whom I am to serve. So when, I, when you answer these questions, um, I want you to think about the fact that we're program rich and alignment poor. I mean, I have seen in the short time I've been here some of the most amazing work ever. Not just in the school, but those ancillary support institutions. Um, I know I can, Boys and Girls Club, um, the why, I mean, people are doing some amazing work um, really supporting these children in ways that they can be successful. But it's not aligned. And I'm a part of <coughs> what I'm tasked with is to go out, talk to all the people who are doing all the work, and it has to be facilitation because guess what? I have no control over anything. 
Everything that I do will be a negotiation of how can we look at the interdependence, the interrelatedness that we all have and work in the best interests of our kids and communities to merge some of the work that we're doing so that we have the best minds not doing duplicative work or fighting for the same support and the same funding, but find a way where everybody can stay at the table and understand how what work relates to what work and how we can all remain a part of the work. So I want, if you could give me feedback on, number one, this is Ohio. How is this going to work in Ohio? Um, getting people to come to the table, um, give up something. Because when you come to the table to work in an interrelated, interdependent way, everybody's giving up a little bit when you start merging and converging work ideas. Tell me how that's going to go over. I'm getting a little bit of ideas of local control already, by the way, I can tell you. Um, but you have such a rich choice uh, environment here um, with the win-win um, districts within Columbus City um, and children having the opportunity uh, to go to the districts they choose if there is space available, the voucher system, the charter system. Ohio has a really robust landscape for education and a lot of support around it. So if um, any of you would love to tell me about what you think about this systems alignment idea, this systems thinking, how you may have experienced it here in Ohio, um, any tips you may have, if there are challenges, if you've had experiences, what did you do to mitigate them? I'll stop talking and hopefully hear from some of you. Yes, sir. I guess I'll start out by saying it works. Corporations do it all the time. So if it does work, they're probably a little bit more on the fire than what the uh, educational system might be. But I think a lot of it goes back to what you said in your, you know, your last statement, which is duplicative. Mm -hmm. Those parents work there so they know that this is a part of how business is done and how, how things are done. We're all supposed to feel some pride in our business too because we work hard and we do all this stuff. And they can track a little bit more international pride and it's going to be a, it's going to be a nice product. Yeah. 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 I would start with the why. I would put data in front of people and say, I don't know what your perception is about how we're doing, but this is how we're doing. Um, and, and so I would make the case of why we needed to change. Um, probably I would not be as prescriptive because what we did in building our strategic plan and then what the Race to the Top grant asked for were four areas, four core areas. In talking about the why and putting the data up in front of people, I think that should evolve from the group. Okay, if this is our reality, what are we going to do about it?
North Carolina is my home state, so I know that Wake Forest story pretty well. And I think that is where the systems thinking has to include the community because, at, because what we do may not necessarily be the answer. If we could get better ideas from other people, um, maybe the district could have been a little more thoughtful about the, the movement. But. George Barrett, um, who is one of my co-chairs uh, for Future Ready Columbus, CEO of Cardinal Health, and I had this conversation. And what he said is, Lillian, people aren't afraid of change, they're afraid of loss. And so as we go through the change process, people have to see where I fit in and how do I get to keep and be beneficial the way I have been uh, with the work that I do. So. I think that probably, you're right, is the first tipping point. I, I saw a hand. Yes. And, and a lot of the systems thinking focuses on collective impact. It's become a new buzzword. But really, uh, how do we bring everybody together? And what Stroh says about there are three things that can kind of sideline us and get us in trouble. One is that we allow leaders to just talk about the successes that they've had and not make sure that they are looking at the challenges and how they need those people sitting at the table to help them work through it. The second is we make snap decisions in a sense of urgency without thinking of unintended long-term consequences. Um, because at the end of the day, you also don't want to lose your get people because they get nervous and they say, well, I'm going to go somewhere where it's a little more stable, like Raleigh to, um, to Ohio. And then the third is if you go to the community and tell the community that you're listening to their voices and it's going to inform their work, they had better see something that they talked about show up or that trust is completely eroded. So, yes. Thank you. 
theory of law that you believe the law for the conclusion, right? I'm giving you an assumption, and no one can really determine that it's an answer. And so, for me, what that tells me is that the decision makers themselves don't understand the issue we're really facing. This is a different class. I think in higher ed programs, the, the leadership um, hasn't understood across the sectors, the state of Ohio, the state of Ohio is easy to prove the role of Department of Governmental Policy plays in the economy of the state, and that's where we are. Why? Because they don't understand the interrelationship on a public front and a private private level, especially for the both states. And so, so that becomes the, the human case. And so when we're confused for resources, everybody thinks it's a zero-sum game because the vision is too abstract. This would be my point, right? right. You right. say, well, the students are going to have a better education. That doesn't really mean anything, right? right. Because an infinite number of possibilities flow from that. Right. And one of the things <coughs> I think for us to be successful is leadership has to sort of take in the ground, take a risk with the costly horizon. Now, if you talk about fantasy, That's right. right. Where's the horizon? What are we promising? Mm -hmm. It can't be too safe. It can't be safe. Meaning, if we don't mean it, it's at risk. If I, if I tell you I'm going to miss you in five years, and I'm very promising, and I don't get there in five years, then if it's safe, I can always come up with things along the way. <laughs> I, you, I think you uh, summarize it perfectly. That's why we had issues in both states. The goal was abstract enough that any perspective was the right perspective. There, there was no concrete understanding of what the sacrifice would be. There were unintended consequences because the lack of clarity. Absolutely. And, and so then one spends an inordinate amount of time backpedaling and redoing things that should have been done at the forefront and we wouldn't have had those issues. One more, and then I'll talk to you about Future Ready. Yes, sir. Um, I, I think part of, the, part of the issue in, in this area, too, is, is how, how many of the people are, are, are going to be greedy, and, and how many people are going to actually look at the data? Because I think the data doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. So if you pull the data out and look at the data, but then you have somebody that says, well, operationally, they're doing a great job. And then they start trying to fall back on operationally. So... I think that's the, the whole thing is everybody is doing the right thing and keeping the children as the forefront. Um, but again, I, I, you, you're going to have that, those people who want to say, well, we don't want to change because operationally everything is good. Mm -hmm. Maybe the data says that mm -hmm. everything is not good, but operationally we're doing well. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the spin on, the spin on, how they can say, well, we're doing well because this is going okay, mm -hmm. and, and not really seeing the true, the true data and understanding that it's a tool to be stuck with. And, and that's and it gets back to that point about um, the the inner relationships, the interdependence, but it also gets to the point of leadership. What do leaders do in, in situations like that? Um, and I do think clarity um, is where we go uh, to ensure that people are understanding the path forward. But I do also believe that that's, as Stro said, we get in trouble because we don't want to handle the truth. So we look at the, the bright spots and we want to just kind of stay there and not look at those challenges where we can really work with the people around us to get better. So Future Ready Columbus has all the right people at the table all the right people at the table. It is a public-private partnership. Um, my board is um, George Barrett, CEO of um, Cardinal Health, and he is affiliated with the business community, particularly the Columbus Partnership. Um, the mayor, Mayor Coleman, is the other co-chair. Um, the Future Ready Columbus evolved from an education commission um, that was started by the mayor and Mayor-elect Genter. David Harrison is the president of Columbus State Community College. Um, Dan Good is superintendent of Columbus City Schools. And uh, Commissioner Marilyn Brown. 
So we have the business community, we have the city, we have higher ed, we have local school district, we have the county. Everyone has a vested interest. And the, the mission um, is to work collaboratively with Columbus City Schools. And for those of you who live in Franklin County, you know how um, interesting that gets because Columbus City has children in all kinds of districts. They're called RIM schools if they're in one of the women districts. So looking up broadly of how we help those students be successful. Three organizations came together, Learn for Life, which um, was a, an organization that was um, launched to look at collective impact uh, with a primary focus on early childhood. And my friend Eric, Eric is here for Action for Children. He's been a great thought partner with me. Because if we can get them into kindergarten ready, that makes everything a lot easier as they go path forward. Learning Circle was launched within Nationwide, um, and it is a data organization that does what we need to do, collects the data, puts it in any kind of format that we need. Um, they've done something really great with our support services. Um, we call them digital backpacks. So if the Y is um, helping children that go to certain schools, we get permission from their parents because of federal law. Uh, we can give them return on investment data. This is happening because the Y is doing this in conjunction with the school. So everybody can see how they can be interdependent and help each other. And then Kids Ohio is an affiliate, not of Future Ready, but an affiliate housed with us. And I'm sure you know Kids Ohio is like a policy think tank group. What happened is what we've talked about, and I have five minutes to go fast. What happened is what we talked about is when the, the mayor stood up that commission and he had everybody you can think of on that commission, representation from everywhere. When, it, when the commission launched its recommendations, everyone cried foul because I wasn't at the table. So we may have had your union representative there so that that representative come back and talk to you and your colleagues about what was happening, how it's going to impact you. But what happens? You leave a meeting and you get a call and life gets in the way. And so unless there's a formal way to um, engage in that feedback loop, only the people sitting around the table really are profoundly engaged in what's going on. So one of the things that they had to do was launch Future Ready because you all were here. Um, there was the data issue um, in Columbus City, and then there was the levy. And people could have walked away and said, you know what? We tried. People aren't interested in our help. We're walking away. But what this public par partnership said is, no, we, we didn't do it right the first time. We didn't look at those interdependencies. We didn't look at those interrelated um, opportunities to bring everyone to the table in some way have a formal way of doing it, making sure that we aren't having the community come to us, but we're going out and engaging them. So let's start over and do it right. And so we have three councils already established. One is for early childhood education. Um, that's being chaired by Tani Crane from the Crane Group. Um, we have the um, policy council that's being chaired by Christy Angel, who was the mayor's uh, uh, policy person and now is with a new concern um, lobbying which is what she did before and the third is the community engagement being um, chaired by Stephanie Hightower who is the executive director of the Urban League so what we're trying to do now is just go back to the community and let them know that what we're trying to do the aspirational goal of what and, and what I'm saying to people when we go out there, that's flexible because once we look at the data and really get into the weeds of this work, you may help us evolve in a different way. But the bottom line is we want our children to be ready for opportunity, whatever that opportunity is. Central Ohio, you know better than I, has been an economic engine. When other people were faltering, especially in the Columbus region, good things were happening. It's more of a high-skilled, white-collar environment, but nationwide just isn't the CEO or the senior vice president. They have people who do all kinds of things, and that's what we have to have children understand. They have IT. They have 
human resources they have finance offices they need secretaries they need managers all of those things are there so what opportunity is there less prepare them for that you have l brands that they could probably do all kinds of jobs in all kinds of places they are designed those children who are interested in art and design and tech technical drawing all of those things are there there are opportunities when we see those big Huntington and L brands and all we think white collar those organizations have a little bit of everything they're a machine we have to help them know what the opportunities are because a lot of our kids especially in some communities don't even know what the opportunities are their parents work a certain place that's what they know about employment they don't know what the other opportunities are and so we're going to do that the way that I've talked to you with the community engagement policy advocacy um, we're going to uh, make sure that there's a self-fulfilling prophecy and that self-fulfilling prophecy is that we expect every child to be ready for career and if that's through college if that's through trade unions if that's through skilled labor whatever they have something to go to and we have to do it together that that last uh, bottom circle the public private partnership is that interrelatedness in those um, interdependent ecosystems in which we all live and thrive thank you thank you for your feedback